Um, I just want to thank you, Ruth, um, for the screening. It was great to see the works in, you know, in a cinema. So I'm used to seeing them on quite a small screen generally. Mm. So it was really nice to see them how they're meant to be shown. So I wanted to start by thanking you. Um, I think the first question really um, I've got is about form, really, or, or maybe yeah. about history as well. Because I'd like you to, I was struck by not only the similarities, but also the differences between the two pieces. And I wondered whether you'd, um, can you all hear me, by the way? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I wondered whether you could tell me a bit about the journey from radio to New World. Yeah, I think the big difference with the New World and radio is that radio, I edited all those films myself in my little studio, just like this. And the New World I took to an editor and we negotiated the sort of expansion of the of the footage, of the narrative, everything else. So I think it's much more cinematic. I think the New World is much more cinematic, whereas radio was more like so sort of garage, you know, it's like making art in your bedroom. It was deliberately, I was working with camera phones, pixelation, sort of crash editing stuff together. Whereas the new world is just, it's like taking it and kind of stretching it out and giving it space. Yeah. No, it's interesting. I wouldn't have put it that in such negative terms, really, because that one of the things that marks your oeuvre, I feel, is the you know, degrading of the image yeah. and the, the painterliness of that and coming from a painting background. Yeah. That's something I really enjoyed about your work. And I mean, I think it's in New World as oh, well. Oh, the New World is very pixelated as well. I'm not, it's just the way it was put together. Right. I think there's something very intense. Although I'd say that the themes are the same all the way through, which is actually quite shocking to me. It's like, it, it's like the human condition as just mm. love and war. Mm -hmm. which you know it's just because that that's was it that was another thing I was going to ask you because uh, another thing that strikes me about your work is this interplay between the macro and the micro if you like yeah. between the you know human relations and, and kind of global relations mm. um, both visually but also in terms of the narratives and I wonder you know is that something that you set out to do or is that you know how does that Operate no, I think it sort thinking. of comes from be being very interested in novels okay. and, the, the, you know, not really liking theory. Mm. And when I was doing my PhD, I just read tons of novels. And um, because novels embed theory and philosophy and usually within, you know, no novel is interesting unless there's love. Mm. And then there's usually a drama um, <laughs> or a tragedy because, you know, you can say yeah. the human condition is miserable and ghastly, but it's not. It's, you know, there's there's hope in all of that. Well, I was going to say there's hope in your films as well, because on the one hand, they're all about, you know, failed relationships, failed say, self. At one point, you even say, I'm a, I'm a failure. Yeah. Um, so, there, you know, there is a lot of failure. There's a lot of existential angst, but within that, that there's a lot of hope, isn't there? And I think so, but I think in the new world, it's really about sort of women who are crippled in within patriarchy and yet trying to kind of, you know, Francesca, the woman in the car, is trying to speak, and she's speaking in all these voices of film stars and Hollywood films, but trying to kind of put things together. Um, and this backdrop, I mean, she's in this car and you can just see all these... Orthodox Jewish man walking past her and at some point her Magen David is exposed and you realise she's probably Jewish but what's she doing in a car with all these Orthodox kids walking back and forth and then there's a black guy and then there's some white twins and you know it's really that was Stamford Hill in the 1980s mm -hmm. um, and, and it's really odd I mean I find that you know her as the central protagonist is quite strange um, yeah. she's, she's, she's reflecting and mirroring and desperately trying to speak in a, in a patriarchal frame, perhaps. Yeah, because yeah, I was going to ask you about desire, because I was very aware that 
she was surrounded by all these glamorous women who were objects of desire um, in Hollywood. So it was, you know, a male, a desiring gaze of the male, if you like. Well, it's not, but because, it's not. because I'm a lesbian. Exactly. So, so it's it, like, you know, although I don't kind of go, oh, this lesbian film, and like, look, here's some lesbians. It's <laughs> kind of like, you'd have to sort of, you'd watching it, anyone watching it would think, there is a desiring situation mm -hmm. going on with these women, but it's not objectifying because the the desirer is also a woman. There's but, and it's it's and a it's kind of yeah. Uh, but it's about the interrelationship of all the clips as well. Yeah. So the way you put them together, I feel, changes that dynamic because it's not about in a Hollywood film. It's always like the men talking to each other, and then there's a woman somewhere. Um, you know, and Laura Mulvey talks about how the woman stops the narrative. Yeah. But in your film, it's the women and their interaction that's driving the narrative. And and I can't remember who said that. Uh, um, someone out there might remember um, says how the mark of a feminist film is when t two women actually talk to each other. Yeah, that's the than, Bechdel test. Yeah. You know, are there are there more than is there more than one woman? Yeah. Do they talk to each other about anything other than men? Yeah. So, um, you know, in, in your film, they're, they're women talking to each other through your narrative. Yeah. Um, so that changes th that desire, but it's still potent with desire, isn't because, it? Or because there's a lot of unconscious. Go, mm. You know, I don't write a script and have people kind of go, oh, so how are you today? <laughs> um, and are we going to get married at the end of this? It's it's <laughs> going to be um, more about, you know, sort of strange unconscious mirrorings going on mm. and, and also taking those women, be it Tippi Hedren from Marnie or... and sort of taking their moments of profound disturbance, mm. actually, and kind of putting them in a different, or Jackie Brown, Pam Greer in Jackie Brown, kind of s cut into Katz's deli, mm. Um, mm. smoking and waiting, and wh why sh what's she doing? Mm. <clears throat> and the other thing is, it's a very cosmopolitan world. It's not just white people. It's not, you know, and you don't quite know what everyone's relation is to each other, but it's, it's also not only a kind of feminist desire going on, but also mm. a... A, a multicultural is that the word a very hybrid mm. world where you don't have to say oh look there's a Chinese person and oh there's a black person it's like and even Francesca the Jewish person in the car um, is mixed race mm. you know she's Ashkenazi Jewish and Indian not Jewish and so everyone's a little ambiguous. Everything's a bit ambiguous. Yes, and that, that extends to the sense of place as well, because um, one yeah. of the other things that's really important in your work is, is the kind of on, this sort of ongoing road movie of co you know, composite spaces and composite yeah. places. So you have kind of composite people and composite places all speaking it's to each true, other. It's true, and jumping from God knows where. You know, one minute you're in a plane, next minute you're on a road, and this re reusing, remixing of certain footage that seems to me very classic. Like, so what is it about the composite? Because I mean, uh, you know, we've talked about how one of the big paradigms is the long look, isn't it? The long take. But your work is is this collage. But that's it. It's the it? fr the yeah. fragment. I mean, is it a monster? You know, in in the extracts from Goddard, when she's f spelling out her name, Frankenheim. You know. Is this a Frankenstein Frankenheim? Is there is there is it unheimlich? I mean, mm. have I made a monster from this bricolage of of you know women, eras, mm -hmm. places, spaces, or is it an, an ideal? Is it a unreachable utopia of you know? Is this what a a hybrid um, gumbo or would look like, or is it, it the sort of smooth idea of the melting pot? Or the spark of contingency, because one of the things that I'm really taken by your work as well is the way you replay and replay, and you take different bits of footage and you reuse it in different contexts. Yeah, it's contexts. embarrassing. It's like, so oops, we've seen that footage in like all, <laughs> all of the films. But, but, but that's about contingency, isn't it? That it changes the meaning profoundly exactly. every we're, time you use it. We're, so we're depending as well on the soundtrack that's mm -hmm. with it. I mean, whether it looks really sort of 
sinister or threatening or menacing or sweet and happy. So, so the, the magpies in radio go from being, you know, quite joyful to being horribly frightening and superstitious. Mm -hmm. And the New World talks about superstition because um, mm. I am actually very superstitious. <laughs> so how much of these, how much of the films are autobiographical and how much are, are they not? Or do you not want to answer that, which is also Well, fine. of course they're autobiographical. But, I mean, you know, how much I am those, I mean, the, the, like the autobiography of my alter ego or, you know, my worst fears. I mean, something I realise about superstition mm. and worst fears is that, and I was thinking, is this a Jewish thing? that I always imagine the worst case scenario, <laughs> really the worst. And I thought, is it, does every Jew have to do this? Because, you know, <laughs> you're so, you. you know, terrified. Ter you know, there's, there's always but a worst case scenario yeah. in, in the past. And do you just carry it with you? Or? But, they're, but they're beautiful worst case scenarios, aren't <laughs> they? They're, they're, you know, the image is beautiful, the people are beautiful, the places. It's so true. I, I don't do sort so of. There's this kind of paradox. You know, I don't do or, gritty realism with kind of, you know. But even the awkwardness is. I mean, I was really reflecting. One, you know, I'm very attracted to this awkward, um, jagged kind of editing that you do, and the the way the sound cuts in and out. And um, but I'm also astonished by how beautiful it is. You know, this beautiful awkwardness. And maybe oh. that's a kind of <laughs> metaphor for... <laughs> that's really nice. That's really nice, beautiful awkwardness. So, you know, maybe that's what you're talking about, these kind of beautiful, awkward, beautiful failures of people. You know, how humanity is this beautiful failure, you know. Um, and isn't it also like making something out of nothing? Mm. You know, mm. taking the detritus, taking rubbish and making it... I mean, isn't that often what art is? Mm. Taking something very... Agnes Martin's paintings. I mean, I was just amazed at how just, you know, very little. Mm. A pencil and some white but yet acrylic. So much. It's yeah. it's sort of speaking volumes. Mm. Not that my work's minimalist, but certainly there are you know, in Phonio that I was acting in a film and I was on this film set and one of the actors it was freezing cold and she was wearing a jacket over this red dress and sort of walking up and down smoking and that was just so fantastic mm -hmm. and I just shot it on my phone and it's just amazing mm. um, that these things you can get from just like pulling out your phone and shooting whatever and then and then mm. because it, it's about reimagining cinema mm. I mean I think the new world is really cinematic because mm. it takes more space um, radio is more like music or music video or you know they're short films that connect to each other thematically mm, mm, but mm. they're more condensed I mean they're all condensed so I just I don't want us to talk all evening because I think it's important you ask questions but I just want to ask you one more thing before we open it up to questions and that's about um, your a lot of your earlier work was very preoccupied with questions of Jewishness and what that might mean and what the point of it is and where that yeah. situates you um, but that's a, that's a lot more bleak in in the more recent work, and I just wondered if you could. Well, talk I don't a need to make that. any more. I made a film about Israel. I made before that. I made a Jewish film, Rootless Cosmopolitans. Then I made a film about Israel, and then it was mm. done. I mean, I made those films because nobody else was making films about everybody who was Jewish was wasn't making it wasn't trendy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't so they were not making Jewish films. So I thought, well. I need to make some Jewish films, so I did them. Okay. They're done. I, I, <laughs> I mean, okay, the, Jewish ni the Jewishness yeah. ends up being in the humour or in, you know, it's, it's implicit. It's mm. sort of embedded within the text. I mean, I'm Jewish and I probably, I don't know what it's like to not be Jewish, so I don't mm. know what it would be like to make... Maybe I should make a goyish a film. <laughs> <laughs> See what that would be. But no, it's just, yeah. I so that was like your, Abbey. your Jewish period. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on, on that witty note, uh, does anyone have any questions? It would be really good to hear. Yeah. Um, so you were talking about the difference of your two films. My, 
Radio is the first one. Mm. See, I must disagree a little bit. Maybe because, yes, they are smaller, but because of that, for me, it drew me in more. And once mm. you're in, it's big, bigger. Mm. Yeah, it's true. Mm. It's true, they are very... Yeah. It's true, you have to get into them. Yeah, if you don't watch yeah. them, I mean, they're, they're almost too intense, but if you don't... Mm. If you just sit there sort of thinking, uh, you know, like you're watching TV where you could miss a minute, yeah. you know, or <laughs> think about something. Yeah, you're right. You're mm -hmm. right. They, 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 that's why it's called radio, because it's that world. Yeah. How do you okay. get into that world? You know, it's too small. You can't get into that world, but it's in the imaginary world in the radio. I mean, to me, in a way, it was bigger because you perhaps because one knows how to watch a movie. So the, you're in movie mode when you see something that looks like a movie. Yeah. So when something is different, you will. And perhaps that happened to me. But all of radio, all of those yeah. films have a different degree yeah. of intent. I mean, Alibi is almost unbearable. It goes so, in, it's mm -hmm. so disturbing. I find it quite disturbing. Um, yeah. I must say another thing, I just really admire the choice of music, mm -hmm. sound. I mean, in a way, that it could function as a sound piece. They're very constructed soundtracks. I mean, I'd, I'd like to work more with silence, like I'd like to work more with the long take, but I, I don't think that's me. I think I'm a mash-up artist, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> I can't help mashing up. You've had a long-standing interest in music, though, as well, haven't you? And you were in a band, and so it's something that is as important. Do you construct the sound first and then the image, or the image and then the sound, or together? Or They kind of happen together. I'll, I'll put a bit of... I mean, obviously, the image comes mm. first. Not really, but I know that I need to... There needs to be sound to go with the image. Yeah, yeah. Which is the great thing about video. When, when I first had used video instead of celluloid, which you know, silent super eight, and then I'd have to dub it with something. Mm -hmm. But I was also a DJ, so I had you know, I I loved all these records, and I wanted to see them mm. on top of imagery and mess around with it. But I think that you know, that's again, it's a lot. There's a long way to go. I've got this idea of how to make the sort of absolutely integrated soundtrack that's like a score that's like one of those great film scores that you know um because in one of them there's you know there's like a bit of bob dylan and a bit of something else and it's just like literally snatches as though you're hearing a car go past and then they're all dubbed yeah Hi. <laughs> um i was just interested about the role of the voice uh, in your world and the fact that it always seems to me as um, out of all these cut-ups and like unconscious, if you want, things that come out of, I don't know the way you exactly work, but you get attracted by images and you just get drawn into it and you mix them up and then this voice kind of is a, almost like a linear, almost like giving up a sort of um, unity to, or yeah. you're trying to desperate to find a unit within this mash up world and you get drawn into it by this voice and I was thinking is that your sort of diary or like something that comes after as a yeah. country or, or is they, they do tend to be kind of thoughts I'm having the, the first film I made that I put my voice onto mm -hmm. in 83 or something 84 I was just watching this 16 millimeter footage silent and I just started speaking into a tape recorder because thoughts would come up and that's when I started so now I'll use notebooks or yeah so all those films they are narratives actually they all have a kind of core that's a poetic narrative that holds it together without without the voice yeah. they they would actually fall apart it's it's kind of the mm. thread that I think holds them together that gives them a kind of an ending well, or I love them very much it's a mirroring with yourself in a sense, I don't know, I yeah. you, but like in a sense we all humans share a certain way of like 
feeling. And so it was interesting in out in this kind of like unconscious images and a synthetic well, version. Yeah. But that's a very personal. Because in the context of um, onward and outward, and you know, women's voices, you know, the voices of women filmmakers, or, you know, what voice? You know, do we imitate? the male voice, or do we find our own voice, however fucked up, fragmented and mad it is, it's kind of, until we, you know, Siksu, Alain Siksu talked about finding the voice, subjectivity, I mean, it's very much a concern, um, even if I like, I tend towards the hard-boiled kind of voice, you know, like the sort of whatever, the detective, there's something detective going on. Did you put your hand up? Or no, you're you're just stretching. <laughs> <laughs> you'll stretch. I hope it's not a really boring question, but um, for your videos, um, like, gen like created digitally, or do you use like old fashioned technology? They're a mixture. Um, most of them have most of them have a little bit of Super 8, um, but yeah, they're, ma they're mainly digital. Is the the new world is... Is huh? that like the final product that made like, digitally? Yeah, together. yeah. So I digitize Super 8. So the new, the new world, I'd say, is kind of 50-50 Super 8 and digital. I really like the idea of like, having some Super 8 and some that's like on an iPhone. Like, it's a really mm -hmm. interesting juxtaposition. Yeah. Like, that's what I do in my work often, like I photograph people on my iPhone and then I'll have like pictures from the old like textbooks and stuff. And, like, yeah. That's a really interesting like way to like, create work. Will you create texture? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, if you if you don't have huge production money, then how do you create texture? You know, you don't have a camera person, you don't have lighting and sets and everything else and you know people to grade the film so a little bit fan footage or um stuff that you film yourself or like 50 50. Yeah. so in new world there's there's a lot of my own super 8 video um and i think the found those of you who know um 20th century cinema um can probably recognize you know i mean that there's obvious ones like godard's vivo sa vie um, some of Hitchcock, this and that. So, you know, for some people, film buffs, it's like, ooh, guess the film. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're into if you're into writing, it's like, guess the book. Um, but that's why it's all listed at the end of The New World, just so that, which they set up the table just, but that actually that was quite important that all the quotes are quoted. Can I, are there more questions? Well, I'll just say one, and then maybe <laughs> there'll be some more. Um, can I ask you about nostalgia? Because I know you're quite interested yeah. in Sve uh, Svetlana Boim's book. Um, and one of the things she said um, was something like, the 20th century started with utopia and ended with nostalgia. Um, and I wondered what your relationship was to utopia and nostalgia, and whether you agree with that sentiment. Well, we were talking earlier about this sort of you know, utopia is a kind of hope, but we know it's ridiculous because we've, you know, if, if the 20th century ended, uh, began with hope, I mean, <laughs> two of the most ghastly <coughs> conflagrations, um, you know, sort of cut into what was, a, a, you know, quite a productive century. Mm. <laughs> you know, there was cinema and rock and roll and all these really great things and and this absolute horror. I mean, yeah. so those of us who grew up in the 20th century are probably struck all the time between horror and hope and trauma and uh, psychoanalysis, moon landings, whatever, Cold War. Um, so the nostalgia I, th I think sometimes it might be to do with my age, that, you know, there's something about the 20th century that I haven't finished with. And I think the 21st has kind of 
whisked us into something that I'm having trouble coming to terms with. There's something that's been lost. And I'm not, I'm not just being, nost I mean, nostalgia is, doesn't it mean the, um, a, a sort of loss of home? Mm. I mean, so, I think your work had nostalgia even when you were making it in the 20th century, though. Exactly. So it wasn't, it, I don't think it's just about looking from now. So it's I not think like, oh, I wish it was still the 1950s. <laughs> oh, I wish <laughs> it was still the 1960s. It's not that. It's about being lost somehow. A lot, a lot of, there's a lot about being lost. Yeah, because that nostalgia is spatial as well as temporal, isn't it? Yeah. So that, that kind of, moving camera away or kind of driving through all these cityscapes of is it London is it New York is it Cairo is it Tel Aviv or wherever um is almost like a nostalgia for for place which I I guess is a kind of nostalgia for home but it's a kind of diaspora or, or it is it is, nostalgia it is for, it's a yearning for a diaspora but I if you know. you know all the Jewish texts you know Zionism W w when it's about the mind mm. and not about a place, is about a yearning. You know, Jerusalem can be an abstract, but the yearning for Jerusalem mm. is not necessarily for a place. It's a yearning. It's all the um, Jewish Sephardi poetry in Spain, the Andalusian poetry, is about a yearning. It's all about, oh, you my heart. Oh, I've, I've lost every, you know, I've lost love. I've lost my home. I don't know. <coughs> That yearning, and it's also part of the desire it, narrative, and it's also part yeah. of the, you know, a yearning maybe even for a world that isn't full of war and horror. Because Jews used to refer to it as galut, which is a dispersal rather yeah. than the diath. You know, it's, yeah, it is that's about a Greek, Greek word. Yeah, yeah, about kind of being pushed out, isn't it? So rather than re return, so the emphasis was about the being dispersed rather than the return, which of course since you know, 48, it's been much more about the return, hasn't it? So, yeah. Are there any more questions? Well, it's a much of a question as comments because uh, your films are very rich and I would think more of melancholia than nostalgia. Uh, the way I see them is that both collage and mashup of things, but as if you wanted to have something, uh, a, a meaning being breaking, breaking through out of this mashup. It's like a Rauschenberg painting. And the more you add up, the more you want to unveil. And also you have, uh, they also have these kind of lines. So you feel that there are different waves coming from underneath, popping up, going down and up again and down again, which works very well with sound and the, the radio waves, uh, the radio, I uh, mm -hmm. saw it as uh, radio waves and kind of trying to tune in, in images. Yeah. Uh, was the, um, the last one was really much about trying to get this underneath yearning, craving, looking for melancholia, waves coming out, the unconscious, as you say, coming out in waves, more or less visible, more or less understandable, more or less uh, tangible, uh, you know, with its own rhythm, rhythms as well. And the choice of footage that you have in that really sp speaks of it because you choose all these. Uh, all these films from the like 20th century, very, very analog, very dark, all filled with darkness that tries to, to come out, whatever it's Hitchcock or, or Truffaut or Orson Welles or, or Pasolini, you know, you always have darkness underneath. It's very much a European film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that comes out and it plays with this dark, uh, darkness and shadows that you have in between. Well, hence the film noir thing. I mean, there's a very strong, you know, yes, it is. They are melancholic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, d I don't think I could ever make, I have made one comedy, but I don't think, and I, there is there is a comic element. In fact, yeah. that Israeli film, Shira Geffen and Edgar Keret's Jellyfish, where the waitress at the bar ba mitzvah or wedding or whatever, you know, drops the food and wipes her hand on her butt and kind of <laughs> <laughs> so. I mean, I kind of identify with her, This the character Batya in, um, in the film Jellyfish, which is a wonderful film and should be watched. Um, because she's just so miserable. <laughs> it's great. A great pace, though. That's nice. 
I love the pace of them and the rhythm. There's a real yeah, rhythm. Yeah, yeah. The rhythm of the sound, the rhythm mm. of the image, and you know the stereo thing going on. It's quite mesmeric, and there's a sort of real urgency as well. There's nothing still, is there? Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have to make a goyisha film. It's like a long take, no <laughs> sound. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being stereotypical. But maybe I should give myself that challenge of. Could I, you know, how would I do that? Probably not. <laughs> I have tried, actually, but it's, yeah. Maybe your long take will be everyone else's short take. So. <laughs> just a thought. Uh, are there any more comments? Or, um, yes. Yeah, I was just, like, thinking about, like, when you said, like, beautiful awkwardness, and I just wondered if you thought, like, beauty had to have, like, an element of kind of darkness. Yeah. Because like, I, I mean, like, I believe that, and it seems to like come across a lot in your work. Like, if I feel like if something's like overtly beautiful, it can be like almost like sickly. I feel like to be like truly beautiful, something needs to have like an element of melancholy. And it's true. You like, can't just do happens. pretty pictures, and I found that out when I was at art school and I was making my first film, and my tutor just said, "This is lovely, but." What else? <laughs> and it was like, that's, then I suddenly realised, yeah, it's like, you know, salt and pepper. You know, you've got to have some, you know, bit of chilli. Have a bit of grit bit of that makes the pearl. Re yeah, I mean, you just cannot have. I mean, you can't, look, there are filmmakers that deal in pure beauty. But that's, you know, I, for me, it's got to have a, a texture. It's the same as different textures. Yeah, melancholy. I mean, ideally, I'd like to make a film that would make you laugh and cry. I'd like to make a film that's sort of deeply emotional um, without having to resort necessarily to melancholy, but maybe... Because, look, I, you know, I can't look it's at the world and think, like oh, wow, isn't it all great? It can be like <laughs> something that's slightly like off-kilter, like it doesn't have to be like necessarily sad. It can just be like a bit like, oh... Kind of kind of well, that's what Svetlana Boym in in the future of nostalgia talks about. She has the off modern had she died unfortunately the off modern manifesto, and she goes off modern. It's like off kilter, off key, off Broadway, and I love this idea mm. of an aesthetic that's awry, a bit a bit rough, mm. but that doesn't mean it's sort of slapdash. But you know, it doesn't over polish mm. things, perhaps. Mm. Doesn't give it so easily. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's probably a nice place to stop. Yeah. Thank you all for your contribution. <laughs>